Today I'd like to kind of give you an overview of why we've been fighting against government and medicine all these years. And as you know, we've been the voice of private practice since 1943. I'm a member of AAPS because I believe that medicine is between a doctor and a patient, not between a doctor and a government bureaucrat and a patient. And the other major point that AAPS makes continuously is that a doctor's duty is to the individual and not to the collective. Now, I'm always, actually, I'm, I'm really shocked when I read very smart people who seem to be free market guys, like Donald Trump. I read his book a few years ago, and he's a free market guy right up until he gets to medicine. And then he becomes kind of socialistic. And I, and I think the problem is, is that people, just people who are not in medicine, and people just see this as such a complicated problem that they can't see their way out except through, through government. So I'm hoping that I can give you some, some facts to counteract the talking points that you constantly hear being drummed into us of why we need government. The argument for why we need government is always it decreases costs, will increase access, and increase quality. But I'm here to tell you that government does just the opposite. It certainly increases cost. I mean, you know, the, the government that brought you the $600 toilet seat has brought us the nightmare in now. And it, it, it certainly does not increase access, although that's its major claim right now. And then it decreases quality. Now, the other point is that it's, it's not just about health care. It's also about our liberty. And I have a friend, Gene McCurley, who used to work for Campbell Soup, and he always says, the farther you are from the problem, the clearer the solution. And one of the problems is that we have a lot of people jumping into this debate who have never practiced medicine, or if they have, they've been in a setting where they've never had to pay their own light bill and, and pay their own staff Christmas bonus. I've, I've been in private practice for 20 years, so I think I have some information. Now, the first, the first thing I want to say is, the, and this is the, the talking points you always hear, and I, I'm going to call them disinformation points, but anyway, you always hear, the U.S. medicine's poor quality. It ranks 36th in the world. That's by the World Health Organization, behind the Sudan. Now, really? Are you really going to go to the Sudan? I, I just think that's crazy. And, it, and, and people that know think it's crazy. I mean, if that were true, why did two premiers of Canada, Danny Williams is the latest one, uh, and a bunch of their, their parliament members and athletes come across the border to America for their health care? If government universal health care is so great, why didn't they stay home? When the Sultan of Brunei, who's dripping in gold and go anywhere he wants, needs to have health care, trust me, he doesn't go to Sweden or France or any of the <clears throat> socialized nations. He came here. I know I, my friend treated him. When Boris Yeltsin needed his heart surgery, he had American-trained physicians. He was treated in a special hospital only open to the Politburo, and he even flew Dr. DeBakey over, who was, I think, 95 at the time, to supervise, because he knew what, what the World Health Organization apparently doesn't, that his own universal free health care system was good for the gray masses, but not good enough for Boris Yeltsin. The other one is, you always hear, our, dis our medical care is so bad. Look, we pay all this money, and we don't live as long as X. You know, we're always, our life expectancy is bad. Well, even Wikipedia realizes that the big, big thing for life expectancy is genetics and lifestyle. But the other thing is, we have a very different way of counting infant mortality. So anytime anybody says our life expectancy is low, this is really what you have to say. You know, in Switzerland, unless you're 30 centimeters at birth, you're not counted as a live birth. Okay, that, that gets rid of all those premature infants. In America, you have one heartbeat, one breath, you're at live birth. And that, since, you know, that, so the, 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 the baby that dies right then, he had averages Dr. DeBakey out, who lived to 100, down to 50. You know, I mean, that's just our problem. We count everybody. In Cuba, um, they, uh, they don't even give you a birth certificate at birth. There's so many, there's such a high perinatal mortality rate that they don't want to waste their bureaucratic paper. So what they do is they say, come back in two or three months, we'll give you a birth certificate. Now the other thing is, the, you know, we kill what, up to upwards of 40,000 people every, every year on the roads. You know, if you live in Luxembourg or Liechtenstein or someplace, you're not going to travel very far, 20 minutes across the country, you're not to do that. So there are a lot of things that affect our, our mortality. The real question you have to ask yourself is, not, not what happens when you're well, but when you're sick, where are you going to go? When, we, when you really need medical care, how are you doing? Now, this comes from Lancet Oncology a few years ago. And this, so this is the British Journal of Cancer. And they looked at all around the world at cancer survival rates. Now, I pick cancer because cancer tends to have a bad outcome a lot of times and needs treatment. But you can pick heart disease. You can pick a lot of diseases and look how the world is doing. And you'll find, as I did in this paper, that, that we are number one. And I, sub, I, I kind of shortened this. this was, these are tables in this, in this journal article. They're, they list 20 or so countries. 
but on every table we are the number one and it's not chump change if you look at this if you're in the United States and you're a man and you get cancer of any kind this is a kind of lumping them all together you have a 66 percent five-year survival rate okay but if you're in look at Europe 47 percent and Britain which is known as the sick man of Europe 50 years of the National Health Service 45 percent so less than you know more than a 20 percent decrement in survival rate so where are you going to go? Well, that's why the Sultan of Brunei and people came here. Now, Canada is a little better, but I think that's because some of them can jump across the border when they, when they need it. And so here's breast cancer, and you know, you can pick them. I put this up to remind myself, my friend who actually did take care of the Sultan of Brunei, he was, he was an oncologist at MD Anderson, and he went to, uh, he went to Sweden because he had some members in, in his family that were Swedish, and he went to visit these, these relatives. So, being kind of an academic guy, he wanted to go visit a local oncologist. And he, this was not in Stockholm, but some other city. And, and in this place where he was, people came from a, you know, up to 200 miles away to visit the, the local, this, this oncologist. Well, my friend, who was 70 at the time, was still sometimes seeing 60 patients a day. He, was, he had a busy practice, just huge. And he goes over to Sweden, and he spends the day with this guy. And after this guy, who was fairly young, sees 12 patients, he closes his doors. And the reason is because the government only paid him to see 12 patients a day, and that's what he saw. So part of the problem in, can in, uh, in Europe in getting your cancer care is access to care. That's, what, that's the problem in these universal health systems. You know, and here's colon cancer. So you can pick on any, on any, uh, any, any table you want. We're number one. Now, the other thing is, and this is just one that I threw up lately because I keep hearing this. This piece of disinformation that we have, you know, we have all these bad costs, and the reason that we have increased cost is due to duplication of tests. I don't know about you. This is not something I can prove right now. I'm going to work on it. But to be honest, I'm a practicing physician, and I know that our office spends a lot of time getting tests from other places or getting a CD or getting, you know, the x-rays on a CD. Now, I think the reason that you keep hearing this, it's a very simple little throwaway line that people use. Oh, we, if we had centralized health care with everything computerized, we wouldn't have this problem of duplication of tests. But really what's happening, I think, is this. How do they get data? They get data because the Medicare people have all this data based on all these codes. And they see that a 75-year-old man gets an EKG one month, and a month later he gets an EKG, and they think that's a duplication of a test. But the scenario is probably something like he goes into the emergency room, and he has substernal crushing chest pain, and he gets an EKG. He's ruled out, and a month later he has substernal crushing chest pain. You're not going to not do an EKG. So I think that this is a lot of duplication of tests. In my own practice, if someone has cervical disc disease, and they, they come in, and we get an MRI, and we find out the problem, and we say, yeah, this is your option. You can have traction. You can have an operation. And whatever, and they decide not to have the operation, and they do some things, and it putzes along for a year, and then they decide to have the operation. What are we going to do? We're going to have to repeat the test. You're not going to go in you know, a year later on an old test and do spine surgery. So, a lot of that, I think, is is what we're seeing. The other the other reason for increased costs that you always hear is greedy hospitals and doctors. But you and I know. I'm not going to spend time on this because you all know we we can charge whatever we want, but the government pays us based on this CPT code, and insurance companies pay us on this CPT code, and then a little bump up. Um, in fact, I wrote an article one time. This, it was it was remember when Ob President Obama said, you know, these doctors make thirty thousand dollars cutting off a leg, and, and instead they should be treating the diabetes. And I said thirty thousand dollars. I said, wait a minute. And I went to my billing service. I said, how much do I get for an amputation? And they said, well, is it below knee or above the knee? And it was three hundred seventy-five dollars below the knee, and it was five hundred dollars above the knee. Now they probably think I would, you know, go higher just for that little more reimbursement. But it's pretty sad that they don't really have an understanding of this. The other one you always hear is that technology is driving costs higher. Now, let's look about technology in any other walk of life. Is technology more expensive than anywhere else? I mean, this was the computer I had in 1985. It cost me $4,500 and had 64 kilobyte of memory. I mean, versus the computer that Jeremy's running this thing on, that's probably $1,000 and two gigabyte of memory. I mean, technology costs have come down in every other realm except where government puts its hand in helps us. This is really the problem, and you may recognize the, the picture here, but this is really our problem. Our problem is that we are faced with over 150,000 pages of, me of Medicare regulation. This is our own very honorable Dr. Huntoon with, he always talks about, if you've heard his lectures, he always talks about little Frank and big Frank, so I actually asked him for a picture. 
This is Little Frank, which is his small stack, and this is just his correspondence to Medicare over the years. Big Frank, which he, I think was too big to take a picture of, is, um, is, the, is the stack of all the Medicare regulation and, you know, the quarterly circular, the monthly circulars and all the stuff is taken over. So don't let any of that fall on you. We don't want you to be crushed under the weight. And let me give you a really real world right now example of how Medicare regulation makes things bad. You know, do, does all the things that I just said that they, they claim they can do. Here's DVT testing. You, okay, you guys know about Doppler ultrasound for, for ruling out a blood clot in your leg. Well, this is a real thing that's happening right now. If you, if you work at a small hospital around the country, you may be exposed to this. They, for 20 years, I don't know how long the test has been out, we've been successfully doing this test to, to, to rule out DVT. So the, the, it's, it's not done, you know, just fly by night. I mean, we have a board certified or a certified uh, ultrasonographer, and this is a test that's run by a board certified radiologist. Okay, but Medicare has just come in and said, no, you can't do this unless your ultrasonographer is certified for Doppler ultrasound. It has to be specially certified just for this test. And we said, now wait a minute, we've been doing this for 20 years. Are you kidding me? And they said, no, no, can't do it until you get tested. I said, we, well, we, thought, we think this is stupid, but okay, where do we go get certification for our ultrasonographer? Oh, it takes two years. So they basically have, it means what, a new graduate can come out with this, but the people you already have can't do it now. And for those of us in small hospitals that may only have one ultrasonographer, it's cut down to be able to do the DVT testing. Now, what does this mean in practical terms? Okay, I'm a surgeon and, and you know, you have, or it doesn't matter, anybody that has patients lying around the hospital, you know there's a risk of having a swollen leg that could be a, a DVT. So it used to be we could wheel that patient down the hospital hall, five minutes later we'd get the test, and within an hour I'd have an answer whether to treat or not to treat. Now, oh, and that cost Medicare $235. Okay, now we have to bundle that patient. First of all, it takes about an hour of staff time to call around and find a hospital that can do the test. Then we have to bundle the patient up into an ambulance and trundle them 30, 35 to minutes to an hour away to a hospital, get the test where they're not very prioritized and lying around in a radiology suite, and if we're lucky, they're back in six to eight hours, and we may get the answer within 12 hours, you know, six to eight hours if we're really lucky. Well, we've added $3,000 minimum to, of an ambulance ride to this now $235 test, so it hasn't decreased cost. God knows it's killing the quality, and, I'm, I, and it may kill patients. I, I really feel strongly. In fact, I found out just last week that there are hospitals near me who are practicing civil disobedience or pretending they don't know this because they just don't want to kill anybody. I mean, you're, you're taking a night. You might be a very sick patient. You don't have a doctor or a nurse, and you're in an ambulance going off to God knows where. But here's the real kicker, okay? It's access. Now, let's say you're in the bed next to this Medicare patient and you too have a swollen leg but you're 50 years old you have you've been working all your life you've paid for really good insurance you pay seven hundred dollars a month for your health insurance you also need a, a Doppler ultrasound so we said to Medicare well we should be able to do that on on patient that's not Medicare right this is just a Medicare regulation and they said oh no that would be discriminatory against Medicare patients. So you who have paid for your insurance to get this service are going to get lousy care because of this Medicare regulation. Uh, this is just, this is a classic of what they do. And somebody thinks they're making us safer with this. Um, you know, the other thing that's happening is it used to be when you came in the hospital, you could take, you could use your own medications. Now they've said, no, we have to give you the medications. So what might have cost you nine cents a pill for a thyroid medicine, for example, is now three dollars minimum in a Medicare facility. And this is going to add up, and this is direct cost to the patient based on just a little regulation that they passed. Here's one of, if you think this is all crazy, this is one of my very favorites, and this just shows you how these things come to pass. This, is, this, this kind of came and went over about a, a year period, but at one point, they wouldn't, I, you know, I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon, they would not let me put on a wrist splint. I could, I could put bone, I could put plates on your forearm, I could put an external fixer on, I could cut off your damn arm, but they would not let me apply a pissant little Velcro wrist splint unless I got certified. I said, certified? Who's going to certify me? And the answer was an orthotist with nine, nine months of education after high school and a little test. Now, I'm, I love my orthotist. This is not to demean orthotists, but you've got to be kidding me. And it, it was really a shakedown. What the answer was, I was supposed to pay $3,000 every other year in order to be able to put on these wrist splints. Now, this is a picture from Amazon.com. You can buy this wrist splint from yourself and put it on for $35, which is what I charged to put it on in my office. 
What was happening then, patients had to go down to the orthotist, because my billing service says, Doc, you don't make $3,000 every year on, on splints, so, so I never got certified. Well, so people would go down to the orthotist, you know, and I felt bad about that. They'd have to leave my office and go down to the orthotist where they paid about $90 for a splint, so it didn't decrease cost, this little regulation. And um, it was often put on by the secretary. I know, because they'd come back in follow-up, and, and I'd say, who actually put the wrist splint on? Because even the orthotists realized that it really wasn't needed a, a highly trained specialist to put this splint on. Well, the kicker is, I, I was really hot about this one day, and I happened to be shout, pout, shouting out about this to my local orthotist, and it turned out, little did I know, he was the guy who was on the National Review Committee for doing this, and he set this regulation up. And how did it come about? This shows you how these regulations come about. He had seen the local family practice guy put on a splint that he didn't agree with, and he thought, these guys are really not qualified to put on splints, and we need to, we need to qualify them to make sure that nobody that's not qualified puts on a splint. So he writes this regulation, and it gets put in those quarterly circulars that you get, and it becomes the force of law. And it, it's unbelievable, but that's how these things get started. Good ideas, but they think it's a good idea, but it has terrible outcomes. Now, I don't have to tell you about the FDA and how it increases the cost of medicine. You know, see, the average takes 15 years to get a drug to market, and we had a great talk here a couple years ago by Sam Kasman, who said, you know, just think when they tell you it's going to save 35,000 lives this year because we've passed this drug that for 15 years we've been killing 35,000 people a year because we didn't pass it. So, so there's, this is not just about money. But it's also, you know, I, I went to India a couple years ago down in southern India and, uh, to do some charity surgery. And I got a sinus infection. I have some allergies. So I had to go get some antibiotic. And I went to this little, it was a dirt floor pharmacy on the street, and I bought myself some antibiotic and some decongestant. In this country, that would have cost $100, and I don't know what it was in rupees, but it was the equivalent of $1.20. Now, is it is exactly the same, was it exactly the safe had it been checked and triple checked through the FDA? Probably not. Is it worth 98 out of $100 what we're paying for that marginal safety improvement? I mean, that's really what we have to ask ourselves. But beyond that, I'm going to tell you how FDA regulations are constantly increasing costs in stupid ways. I mean, that's why, that's why you, this is just intrinsic to government. External fixers that we put on in orthopedics. Now, six or seven years ago, these things cost $5,000 just for, the, just for the, the fix. That's the, the wholesale cost of the hospital before it gets put on. Now, what we used to do is these were made for more, more over, to be used over and over. They had little pieces you could beef them up if the bushings went bad. And what you would do is you'd get new pins every time to put in the bone, but you'd reuse the fixer. And then you'd charge a rental fee to the patients. Well, you know, now what happened is, and I don't fault industry, industry is going to be holding to their stockholders and they're going to try and do the best they can. And when an FDA regulation comes out that's going to help them make money, they're going to do it. So the FDA comes out with a new regulation and it says, in effect, if you're going to reuse something that is for one time use only, you have to go through the FDA testing just like it, they did the first time to prove that it's safe. Now, no hospital can do that. I mean, no hospital has the wherewithal, at least at you know, the local level, to, to, to go through the FDA process to get something approved. So what happens? Anything that's labeled one-time use, we have to throw away. So they start labeling everything one-time use. And so now these are labeled one-time use, and we throw them away. It's tragic. The, uh, the other day, I went to the scrub sink, and there was no soap. I said, what's up with this? There's no soap. And they said, well, now the state inspector's here, and the soap was outdated. Hippocleanse, it's outdated. <laughs> Now, you think about that. It never occurred to me, but how stupid is that? I mean, does your palm olive detergent get outdated when you're in your kitchen sink? No. But we put these dates on things, and then we throw away cases of them. We threw away three cases of Hibiclens. You know, and I, I had to say, you know, it's better to, to scrub with outdated soap than not to scrub at all. Let's, let's get this back. But this is just ridiculous. Okay, the next thing is, you know, medical care is so much more compassionate because no one's left out. Now, you know, what do people complain about to you about medical care? I don't know about you, but when my patients come in and they're complaining about something that happened to them, they don't come in and tell me, you know, my doctor failed to give me the latest generation of ACE inhibitor. What they say is, you know, he was rude to me, or um, I was rushed, or I didn't get, feel that they really cared about me or anything. Now, a few years ago, the National Health Service was actually going to barcode patients. You know, if you think you're going to get personalized medicine from government medicine, you know, think again. That's not, you never see the same doctor twice, and it's total cookie-cutter 
factory type medicine. Now, Dr. Carisco is going to talk, so I'm not going to take his thunder, but this is, this is, he tells a really good story. Um, Dr. Carisco is one of our members, and he's, he was a Canadian radiologist who moved to this country, and he came here because in Canada there was lack of equipment, physician shortages, and really loss of freedom. But he, he tells this story about how when he was young, he thought Canada had the most moral system because it took care of everybody, it didn't leave anybody out like those people in America. Well, his job was to prioritize people for CAT scans. The day he decided to leave the country was that he was looking at CAT scans. And what, what would happen is in this country, you know, there's no place in the country I can't get you a CAT scan within a couple hours, right? But in Canada, because CAT scans don't make a profit, they're always breaking down, there's never enough equipment, and there's not enough people to fix them. And so they sit idle, and he never, it was a three month, in Thunder Bay, which is a big place, there were three month waiting list for getting a CAT scan. Well, he was the guy that had to prioritize who got the top and who got the bottom. And what he would do is he'd go through and he'd read these. He saw somebody with back pain, well, usually back pain, garden variety back pain. He put that to the end of the line until three months later, he read the CAT scan and the guy had this big fungating back tumor. So he felt like he had been compliant or complicit in this whole process that's killing patients through lack of, lack of access. So he moved. Now, the other, the other person that we had speak a couple years ago, and, and he was wonderful, is Jacques Shaoli. Dr. Sha privately, he, he afterwards, I think he was telling about this, how he, he had trained in France or, and, and had decided to move to North America, but he wasn't sure if he was going to come to Canada or the U.S., but he decided to go to Canada, again, because he thought it was a more moral system because it treated everybody until he got there. He's a family practitioner. He realized his patients were dying because he couldn't get them the care he needed. I mean, if, he, if they were a dog, they could get an MRI within a day, but a human would wait six, eight months. And so, you know, on his own dime, he and his, he and his wife spent 10 years of their life fighting this. He, he acted as his own lawyer. And if you talk to Dr. Shaoli and he starts talking about law, just back away because he sounds, he's, he really knows what he's talking about. And he won at the Supreme Court level. And so in the province of Quebec, free fee-for-service uh, medicine is legal. And I think it's kind of ironic, you know, years ago, we, the, the, the heroes of the proletariat were people like Trotsky, but now the local newspaper in Montreal labeled him a hero of the proletariat because he'd stood up against big government. The other thing is medicine's more expensive in the U.S. That's another piece of disinformation. But I actually looked at this. In Canada, it's 40% of, of the provincial budget. In my state of Iowa, it's 25%, and the federal government is 21%. So we, you know, those are equivalent because the rest of it, I mean, th these are not additive. So, so what the federal government pays for, the Iowa doesn't. Okay, and in the British National Health Service, I, they, this is a couple years ago now I wrote this, but the 200 billion pounds a year, and if you do the conversion rate, it figures out to about $5,000 a person. Now, I pay $7,500 a year for health insurance for a family of four with a $2,500 deductible. So if you say it's $10,000 a year, that's $2,500 a person. And the big difference is for that, for, for my $10,000, I get first class service. But in the National Health Service, you've got, a, a, you know, you've got more than a million people waiting for surgery. You know, and they're, you know, the cost is not just in dollars. So this, you're waiting for surgery because you've got bad joints, you can't walk around, you're hobbling, you're in pain, you're, you're leaking from your bladder. I mean, these are things that are not considered uh, urgent. Recently, they had a big uh, discussion in Canada. There was a paper just published about how we can decrease the deaths in the waiting line for people waiting for cardiac catheterization and cardiac care. It's not, they don't kind of step back and say, why do we even have this problem? You know, what, they, what it's about, they had, a, they had a significant death rate of people waiting in line. And of course, the lost productivity when you can't see somebody to get you back to work. And the other thing, disinformation, is, of course, free markets have failed in medicine. But the truth is that we really haven't had free markets for a long time. Sixty percent of medicine in this country is paid for by the government. But think about LASIK. LASIK used to be, there are some little areas, little islands of free markets, you know, our cash practices of our members being a, a major one. But look at LASIK. LASIK was once $5,000, and now you see it advertised for up to, you know, down to 500, and at least it's in the $2,000 range. But this is done by the same highly trained physicians, and it's done with probably better technology than it was when it first came out, and yet the prices have come down. And why is that? It's because it's free market, it's com competitive, you know, it's no insurance or government payment touches it. The actual plastic surgery rates have come down in real dollars, 
And, uh, you know, we had these freestanding radiology suites that showed up so that you could go to the, you know, and I'm not going to argue the medical rightness of this at all, but you, if you wanted to, you could go get a whole body CT scan, and it, it, when they came out, it was like $1,000, and you will have seen a physician to go over the findings, whereas in a Medicare facility, you, for $1,000, you wouldn't even get a CT of your shoulder. I mean, it's, it, it was a good deal. And I think the real issue in price and, and, is this. You know, we have in America the, the most abundant cheap food. And the reason is because we don't have a, a food delivery system, thank God. We have independent farmers and independent grocers and truck drivers and all these people acting through their own self-interest who produce food cheaply and efficiently for, for human consumption. You know, our biggest problem in, in America is obesity. But Unfortunately, we have now we're, everybody's talking about a health delivery system, and the, even the even the Republicans that say they want to repeal Obamacare, they want to replace it. They still don't get the idea. It's the system. It's the intrinsic problem of having central control of your health care system that has made us complicated and expensive. And you know, theoretically, it's the most moral system because it doesn't leave anybody out. But the truth is that government medicine makes criminals of patients and doctors. I mean, let's say, at the end of the day, is it really moral to put a gun to your neighbor's head to pay for your mother's broken hip? You know, no. I mean, no matter how noble the cause is, that's not charity, and that's not the way to go. And then for the doctor, I'm, you know, and if, if you were here last year, I, I talked about this, you know, can we serve the state and serve our patients at the same time? And I don't think so completely. I mean, this is, this is a young man who found this out the hard way. He grew up in a system in the 1930s who uh, had this, these principles, okay? This is, a princi this is what he learned when he was in medical training, that they, they should really emphasize prevention, okay? And these things are going to sound familiar to you, that we should not have smoking, that we should emphasize clean air, pure food, exercise, and a r rational allocation of resources. I mean, if you don't think that's sounding very familiar, it's sounding very familiar. However, that was the German uh, Nazi program. And he was Karl Brandt, that was Hitler's doctor, and he went to the gallows for this. Because when you talk about rational allocation of resources, unfortunately, it ultimately says, I'm going to pick you to get care and not you to get care. And, you know, their conclusion in the Allied prosecutors was these doctors weren't intrinsically evil, but they had been used to working for the government and taking orders from the government for a long time by the time it got to the government being evil in itself. Now, he trained with Alfred Hoche, who was a psychiatrist who, with a lawyer, wrote a pamphlet. And, the, and, and they concluded that a government body of doctors, lawyers, and psychiatrists would oversee judging patients' economic value to society and applying cost-benefit criteria. Okay, let's look at today. Today we have Ezekiel Emanuel writing in The Lancet, and this is the, he wrote with two other authors, and he has this idea, there's a big, big pot of money out there that we're going to take, when we take over health care, this is essentially the article, and you can look this up yourself, when you, we're going to take over health care, how do we rationally allocate the resources, okay? So they came up with a disability adjusted life year that actually says, this is right on the paper, the disability adjusted life year allocation treats life years given to elderly or disabled people as objectively less valuable. Objectively less valuable, really? I mean, that's just shocking to me, but apparently it's not shocking to a lot of people, because I'm hearing a lot of people talk about this, about using resources better. Well, let me tell you, in their complete life system, if you're under two or you're over 60 or have a terminal illness, you just kiss your ass goodbye, because we're the people that are not going to get care. Okay? That's really what this all amounts to. So, in short, government medicine, in my, you know, it, it creates shortages and long lines for care, poor outcomes, more expense, it interferes in the doctor-patient relationship, and ultimately it kills people. And it's dangerous for liberty, because there's nothing that you can't regulate under the guise of safety, right? Everything, everything, everything has to be safety. And we started out pretty good, it sounded good, right, to have, well, let's, let's limit smoking in public places, and let's, let's wear our seat belts, and then pretty soon we got the FDA, and now we're going to limit how many hours doctors can work, um, unless you're out in private practice, then they'll grind you into dust. But wait a minute, that dust is regulated by farmers. I was in Yuma, Arizona for 18 years, and let me tell you, the EPA is constantly telling us we have too much dust. We live in a desert, you know, this is just absurd. But in any case, um, they're going to limit food additives. Now they're it's talking about no salt in the restaurants in New York, and I just love it, no trans fats. Who, and, and the bu building codes are out of control. So, you know, after you get done with all that, are you safer or are you just less free? 
Thomas Jefferson wrote, I predict future happiness for the American people if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. Boy, he was prescient about that. Unfortunately, where have all the Thomas Jeffersons gone? Unfortunately, we're left with <laughs> Vladimir Lenin who wrote, medicine is the keystone in the arch of socialism. He, he knew what he was talking about there. Because if you give your health to the state, what do you have left? They've got you by the throat. Free markets promote the supply of healers and technology. It allows individualized care. And I just, I, let me mention that. You know, one of the great tragedies, we always talk about errors of commission and errors of omission. And, you know, errors of commission are very obvious to see. You give somebody a bad drug, they have a problem, and you, you, you go down. What we don't see is the lost opportunity a lot. You know, same thing with the drugs in the FDA. You know, for 10 years, the FDA didn't pass any new cardiac drugs, but did the, did the people with heart disease realize what they were missing? You know, we have sequenced the human genome. We have the ability, and, and I, I think of, you know, there's some things like the, the anti-aging people out there are really getting on to this. We have the ability to, in a cost-effective way, actually impact people's health individually by treating you as individuals, by seeing what, what works, what's special about your physiology and, and taking care of your deficiencies before they become symptomatic. That's real preventive care. But we're not going to do that under government medicine because government medicine is algorithmic, one size fits all. Um, you know, and, and then free markets decrease costs, as we talked about. And it really makes, it's the most ethical system. I mean, there's always more health care out there than, that people want than people can afford. But the issue is who do you, who do you and, and in every system, people fall through the cracks. People may not realize that, that in British Columbia, 15% of people are essentially uninsured. And it's people that just never bothered to sign up. In the Navy, we used to say there are always 10% that don't get the word. Well, there's always, there's always some people that don't take advantage of the system and, don't, and fall through the cracks. The, is, the issue is, do you want a system where the government tells you who's worth what? Or do you want a system where you guys individually make choices about your own life? And of course, we're the only medical organization to legally challenge the recent health care bill. Our, uh, our lawsuit, Andy's going to talk to you about later. You know, our organization educates the doctors in public through our writings, and, and we have cash practice we promote through our education. We teach around the country. We stand for physicians who have been the victims of sham peer review and for people who have been trounced by the government, and we reaffirm in our daily practice the Hippocratic Oath. Now, do, if, do you know what this is? This, is? this piece of equipment was designed after an Indian practice. This is a tobacco uh, insufflator. It was to do a tobacco enema. So the next time a politician wants to blow smoke up your ass, I just want you to know we have the equipment to do it properly. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm not certified, though. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much. That's it.